If you have your Bible tonight, turn with me to John chapter 12, and I want to say again, I'm humbled and honored to be here with you, Pastor Matt and the family, and so many great ministers and missionaries here. It is, it is literally a, a treasure trove of people who have the repository of the gospel in them to share with the nations, right? I, I was uh, really intrigued by how everything dovetailed with the ministry, and I just want to kind of add a little dot to it uh, tonight as we close this out. John chapter 12, verses 12 and 13, the next day a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Well, it seems all is well with Jesus. It's a high morale. People are welcoming him with shouts of acclamation. But he knows what lies ahead. This, this entrance is the last week before the crucifixion. The Passover lamb is coming to town, and they're going to examine him and through that examination, he's going to be found worthy to be the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. And uh, I want you to know that it seems like everything's going right, but how many of you know he knew what lie ahead, even in the praise and the acclamation that those around him were given at that time? One thing that I know, Russ Phrase said it uh, very clearly this morning I heard it. He said, I'm on assignment until he comes or I go. Did you hear that this morning? Brother Virgil said this, the commission is still in effect until the harvest is reaped. We have to move not only in the beginning and in the middle, we have to go all the way through to completion. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He that began a good work in us will what? Finish that good work. You know, from point A to Z, how many of you know there's an L-M-N-O-P somewhere along the way? And, and so I'd like to tell you that you're never going to have another bad day. Nobody's going to uh, oppose you. You're not going to have any opposition. But how many of you know I would be lying to you if I said that. We have to learn how to move through adversity to completion. That's what I want to talk to you tonight, about moving through adversity to completion. You see, when I think about this, I think about George Washington at Valley Forge or Abraham Lincoln in the middle of the Civil War or FDR in the middle of World War II or Bethany Hamilton at age 13 when a shark bites off her left arm, but by age 17, she wins the surfing championship. Isn't that amazing? Or, or maybe Steven Spielberg, who was kicked out of film school twice, but yet he brought a Schindler's List and Jurassic Park and Saving Private Ryan and Close Encounters. How many of you know he's doing okay? I think he got over it, right? But you see, when those setbacks come and, and people oppose us and they think we can't do it or we won't do it, it can be pretty tough. It could be like Jesse Owens who overcame that discrimination of Hitler in 1946 in the Olympics. Or it could be a young girl by the name of Malala who the, the Taliban went on her school bus and shot her in the head and the shoulder and the arm at age 12. But age 17, she won the Nobel Peace Prize for turning education for Muslim women around. You see, you never know what you're going to encounter in the journey. But how many of you know God can take something that's bad and turn it for good? Genesis 50, 20, Joseph said this, You meant this for my evil, but God meant this for my good. All great men and women... Are going to go through a great deal of adversity. You can't get around it. I can't get around it because the servant is not better than the master. Jesus is coming to Jerusalem, but in the next few days, he's going to be examined. He's going to be questioned. We know at the end he's going to be beaten. But let's go back one chapter. 
one chapter, this is what happens. He comes to Bethany. Martha meets him. Wish you could have been here earlier. If you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And Jesus said, your brother's going to live again. And she says, well, I know he's going to live again at the resurrection. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection. How many of you know the resurrection is not in a date, it's in a person. It's in Jesus Christ. And then through that, he goes to the tomb. He, uh, he has the stone unsealed, rolled away, speaks into the darkness. Lazarus comes out. How many of you know he's on a, he's on a pretty high day here? I mean, many believe because of Lazarus, but yet he's moving toward Jerusalem. You see, at Bethany, he has validation. Bethany has friends. At Jerusalem, he's going to have critics. He's going to have opposers. He's going to have enemies. Bethany is what he has done. Jerusalem is what he will do. At, at Bethany is where he's raised Lazarus, but at Jerusalem's where he'll raise himself. And... Uh, I'm so glad that he has the power to lay his life down and he has the power to raise it back up. Amen? And so he's moving to a place where he knows there's going to be opposition. Let me tell you about my human nature. I have the human nature. I want to stay where it's comfortable. Anybody else like that? You know, human nature is kind of a crazy thing. I can start a diet in the morning and by noon, you know, I can have an apple. And by three, I have a Snickers bar. By four, I have a chocolate malt. By five, I'm off the wagon. Y'all are so holy. You never do stuff like that. But see, this human nature we have wants to keep the status quo. Stay comfortable. Don't press. Don't move. If you have opposition, back up a little bit. But let me tell you, our mission, our calling moves us through adversity to our place that God wants us to be and to accomplish what God has for us. Can I hear an amen? You see, that's something that we all have to face. You see, in Jerusalem, Jesus is going there because it's intentional, and it's also missional. He, like other Jewish men, are going there for the three mandatory feasts, Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles, or Sukkot, and, and there he would face his destiny, the, the, the place is filled. There's a mass of humanity. Jesus in chapter 10 said he's going to lay his life down for the sheep so he knows why he's there. And you and I, we know why we're here, don't we? But we, we, we've got a vision. We, we've got a purpose. We're headed somewhere. And I want to give you tonight very quickly four things, four ways that you and I press through the trying times to get to completion in our life. Here's number one. I have to understand that adversity is a part of my life. I have to understand that adversity is just going to be a part of my life, and I expect it. How many of you know that you can just expect some issues in the days ahead? Have you ever preached a sermon and somebody didn't like it? Have you ever tried to step in and help someone and they thought you made it worse and you became the enemy? We had a couple in our church many years ago and they were having some marital difficulties and uh, uh, he really wasn't doing what he should do and obviously she kind of slipped off the edge of what she should have been doing as a wife and he said, you need to talk to her and so I did go to talk to her and we tried to visit and I tried to get them back on track, tried to do some counseling with them, and just didn't work. Finally, she kind of fell for somebody else, and he went off the deep end. And one day he came to my office, and he was across my desk, and he said, well, if you would have, if you would have talked to her more, if you would have counseled her more, and he leaned over my desk mat, and he got right in my face. He began to be very accusatory to me and said, well, if you would have done that as a pastor, if you would have done that, and I got up and I escorted him to the door and I said, I'm not your problem. I said, you know, I, I'm not the issue here. You, you have a marriage that you guys couldn't reconcile. And the next day he came back and he apologized. But let me tell you, when you and I face adversity, sometimes we come against the wall. The good news about this is David said walls could be 
leapt over, right? We, we can leap over walls. Jesus said we can break through gates. The gates of hell shall not, what? Prevail against us. So when we come against those things, we can just expect it. First Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal or trials that come on you to test you as though some strange thing is happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. So we, we push through, we press through. It's interesting to me in Revelation and also in Ezekiel, we have the face of these living creatures. They're pretty crazy looking, aren't they? Many wings, faces, the face of a man, the face of an eagle, the face of a lion. I kind of get those. A man in our humanity, we worship God and eagle soars in high places. A lion is regal. But do you know one of them is the face of an ox? Have you ever went up to someone and said, you know, I think you, you have a face of an ox. Now, that's not very complimentary, is it? And I wonder, what in the world do these living creatures who represent worship and, and, and the, the, you know, the attitude of what we have around the throne, why do we have an ox? And I think for me, it's because the ox just puts the yoke on. It's not the face of a racehorse. It's the face of an ox. And when the ox puts the yoke on, he may not be flashy. He may not even be fast. But you know what he does? He just gets in the yoke and he keeps going day after day after day after day after day. And he, he works the entire day until the day is over. Let me tell you about a racehorse. A racehorse may be good for a quarter of a mile or a half a mile or a mile, and after that, the racehorse is done. But the ox is steady. The ox is strong. The ox can put the yoke on and keep on going. And part of our worship toward God is just being a people that will finish to the end. Can I hear an amen? Have you ever done this in church? Whatever happened to... What, what, whatever happened to that family? Have you seen so-and-so lately? But what happened to her? What happened to him? Have you ever had that conversation? I've had it hundreds of times. But you know what? I'm looking around here, and guess what? We're still here. We're still here. And you know what that means? We have made up our mind that we're going to go to the end. We're going to finish the race why finish the race? Because we know there is a crown of righteousness laid up for us at his appearing, not just for me, not just for you, but all those who love his appearing. So therefore, we expect adversity, but we're going to press through it to get to the end. And I have to have that mindset. Number two, I have to realize that adversity and trials benefit me. Really? Yeah. Yeah. They benefit me. They cause me to grow from them. Listen to what James said. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face these trials of many kinds because you know that the testing, the trying of your faith produces patience and perseverance. So let that patience and perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. How do you get that? Through trials through adversity, through tribulation, as we're pressing toward the end, as we're going forward to the goal, we face those things, we feel those things, and they refine us. Story's been told, you've heard it many times, about the little boy who found the little cocoon, the chrysalis of the, of the butterfly. And as that thing began to break open, he watched that butterfly try to break out of that cocoon. And as he watched for hours, he thought he would help the butterfly. So he broke it open, and the butterfly could never fly. You know why? Because the struggle is part of the process. The struggle produced the strength in the butterfly to fly. You know, most scientists say when that butterfly presses through the opening of that cocoon or that chrysalis, it forces 
the fluid of the insect into the wings so the wings can spread and fly. Let me tell you, the struggle causes you to fly. The struggle causes you to have strength. And usually we're not thanking God for the struggle, but I'm telling you, the struggle, according to James, causes us to be mature, complete, and lacking what? Nothing, because we are moving through the struggles of our life. Here's the third thing. Adversity and life's challenges places you at the center stage for others to view. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 9. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession. Like those contempt condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to human beings. Can I tell you what the word spectacle is in the Greek? It's the word theatron. Say that with me. Theatron. Now let's all say it. Theatron. You know what we get from the word theatron? Theater. Paul said, it seems to me like through the trials and adversities of my life, God has me on display. And really, that's true. God has us on display. (laughs) I always like the little story about the the preacher who is buying a lawnmower from this big kid. And and he says, is it a good lawnmower? He said, yeah, but he said, to get it started, you got to cuss it. And the preacher said, now, wait a minute. I hadn't cussed in a long time. He said, you pull on that rope long enough, it'll all come back to you. Do you know people are watching how you talk and how you dress and how you carry yourself and what you do and where you go and how you deal with your children, how a husband responds to a wife and how a wife responds to a husband? This is what Paul is saying. God has put us on display. We are like those in a theater. Not only are men watching, Paul said the angels are watching. You see, angels... People are watching us as we go through adversity. We're watching Job as he goes through adversity, through the word of God. We weren't there, but because of the word, we watched his response. We watched how he went through it. There are people in our churches. There are people in our communities that are watching us as we go through adversity. Carrie and I, we had three boys, and our oldest son died at age 24 of pneumonia. Our community watched us as we grieved and as we went through that process. Are they going to really stand up and be the believers? Are they going to be strong? How are they going to mourn? How are they going to grieve? Everything you do, people watch. And Paul said, through adversity, we are on display. I I tell this story really all over the United States. It's It's a true story. One day I was out doing yard work. I I don't like yard work really, but I do it. And uh, I had a weed eater that I was going to weed eat our yard. And so I went out to the front and I got the weed eater and I filled it full of gas. And and, uh, I flipped the switch on, pumped the little plastic bulb and I yanked on it, yanked on it, wouldn't start. And I yanked some more and I yanked some more and it's hot and I'm tired, I'm red, I'm frustrated. I yanked some more and I yanked some more. And then I adjust it and I tweak it and I look at it and I yank some more and I yank some more and I yank some more and finally, now this is really what I did. I took the weed eater by the end of the weed eater and I whirled it over my head and I threw it across my yard as hard as I could. And I stomped into the house. Carrie was in the kitchen and she said, Can't get the weed eater started, huh? And I said, no, how did you know? She said, I saw a helicopter behind the kitchen window. (laughs) Well, when I told that story, I actually told it in church. And when I told it in church, hey, I got a helper. How are you? So I tell this story in church, and I don't even know what I'm preaching about. But as I, as I share the story, I give the altar call, and this lady comes up, and she's crying. She has mascara running down her face. And, uh, hey, it's what you call a captive audience. 
And this lady in her probably mid-30s, she comes down to the front. And uh, I said, how can I pray for you? And she said, well, I think I found a church today. And I said, good. She said, it was that weed eater story you told. I said, really? She said, I'm a pastor's daughter. I'm a PK. And she said, my dad would have never, ever told that story on himself. She said, because in our house, we had to be perfect. We had to watch what we said. We had to watch how we lived. Said, my dad never would say anything that people wouldn't think that everything was right in our home. And I said, well, it's true. I threw the weed eater. I didn't lose my religion. I didn't say bad words or anything like that, but I was so frustrated I threw the thing. And she said, when you said that story and told that story, she said, you became real to me. I I was sharing with uh, some of the ministers this week and today, as Matt and I had some great fellowship, when I, was in, when I was in high school, especially about 13, 14 years old, we went to a Pentecostal church, and let me tell you, back in the 60s, hell was hot, and the way was straight. Is anybody out there? I mean, the way that it was preached and the way it was promoted, it, w- it was quite a message. And, and, and I'm not saying the message was wrong, but let me tell you as a 13, 14, 15, 16-year-old teenager, I sit out there where you're sitting, and they would preach, and they would preach, and they would preach, and it seemed to me like they had everything together. It seemed like they didn't have the issues that I had. They didn't have the problems I had. They didn't have the struggle I had. And I'm not saying they were at fault, but I'm just saying my perception on the other end, I'm listening and and I'm thinking, wow, I don't know if I can live that. I don't know if I can be that good. I don't know if I can be that holy. Hey, thank God for grace, amen? I don't know if I can be what they are. Let me tell you what I did. It's wrong, but I'll tell you what I did. I internalized that and I said, well, if I'm going to go to hell anyway, I might as well go out here and have one hell of a time. And that's what I did for several years. It's not uh, not right, it's wrong. But I'm just telling you, that's the way I internalized that. You see, I don't care whether you're a missionary or a pastor whether you've got 30 people in the church or 3,000 people in the church, or you've been married one week or you've been married 50 years, you go through some stuff. The bird that sings outside your window is not always a bluebird. Sometimes it's a vulture. Everything in the McCord home's not always hunky dory. Sometimes Carrie and I have intense fellowship. <laughs> Y'all are so holy. <laughs> and you know what? Paul said God puts us in the theater to display us so the world can see how you and I are reacting to His word and His grace and His love. And hopefully what happens is when people see us move from our calling and through our anointing to the place that we should be and where we're headed, and they see us go through adversity and trial and trouble, they can see how we're coping, how God is helping, how we're moving in faith and moving in the place that God wants us to be. Listen, everything is not going to be great. It wasn't for Jesus, and it won't be for you. Because there's going to be a time the cheers stop, the hosanna stop, blessed he that comes in the name of the Lord stops. It's going to turn into crucify him. But yet he moved through that to completion. I'm so glad he completed the work, aren't you? 
And literally, he was put on display. If I be lifted up, like the serpent in the wilderness to look at, that's what happens. Paul says that we have become a spectacle to the whole universe. We've been put on display. Here's the last one, number four. Adversity never comes without God's grace, strength, and purpose. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest upon me. You see, it's okay to say we have weaknesses because that's when his power is perfected in us. It's all right to admit that we have issues. I, I, I was having some hot chocolate while Matt drank his coffee today, and we we're talking about this very issue. And I said, Matt, when you got up yesterday and you said that when I was on the mission team there building houses, they said, quit hammering nails and go preach. How many of you remember that yesterday? I said, let me tell you what that did for me. It endeared you to me because you admitted, I'm not very good at that, but I'm good at this. You see, we're not all good at everything. We're not, we have a recovery group at our church. Matter of fact, they met tonight. And our associate pastor and some of our folks, they lead that recovery group. They don't ask me to come to that group. Let me tell you why. Because if I was leading the recovery group, Brother Jerry, this is what I'd do. I'd go in and say, okay, you got trouble with drugs, you have trouble with alcohol, you have trouble with this. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Everybody quit! <laughs> Don't drink anymore! Don't do drugs anymore! Meeting's over. But how many of you know it's not that easy? Because people are in a struggle. There's compulsions. There's, there, there's all kind of things. I mean, the enemy's attacking. Their body's already responded to that. They're addicted. And so somebody lovingly has to take them through a process many times. There are times that God supernaturally delivers, but there's times he doesn't. And so through that adversity, there are people who are gifted to walk alongside of them and say, let me tell you, you can get to the end of this. This doesn't have to destroy your life. And God's grace is sufficient. You don't have to stay here, but his grace is sufficient. Lord, Take this away, take this away, take this away. Paul, I'm not going to take it away, but I will tell you this, my grace is sufficient. Because in your weakness, my strength is amplified. You see, every one of us go through tough times. You, you, you can't avoid it. There's, there, there's no off-ramp of it. There's no exit sign. You and I are headed to completion and we don't want anybody to quit the race is not to the swift it's always not to the strong but it's to those that endure to the end I'm here to declare to you that we have purpose in our heart that we're going to what endure to the end that's my message tonight but from point A to B, there is stuff that we go through before we get there. You go through it. You're going to go through it probably this week and next week. There's no way around it. I like the line when Jesus was going to Jerusalem. The Bible said this. He set his face like a flint to go. There was one interchange with his disciples they said, where are we going? He said, we're going to Jerusalem. He said, they said, what are you going to Jerusalem for? They're going to kill you if you go to Jerusalem. He said, we're going to Jerusalem. And it's just almost like you see him say, okay, let's all go with him and let's all die. You remember reading it? 
Okay, let's just all go with him. Let's all die. But he had a mission. He, he was headed somewhere, and he didn't let the stuff between A and B stop him. He set his face like a flint. So tonight, what are we doing? We're setting our face like a flint to accomplish what God has called us to do. Not easy. N not always sweet. Not always in your mind the way it's going to be. Amen. But I'm glad that when Jesus was lifted up on the cross and before he gave up his spirit, he shouted out in victory, it is finished. He did not say, I am finished. He said, it is finished. What? What I came here to do I've done. I don't know if you like country and western music, but in Oklahoma we got a ton of it. Garth Brooks, Toby Keith, a bunch of them. Country singer Paul Overstreet wrote a song about Genesis 26. It goes something like this. It's about Isaac. Isaac had a blessing from the Lord above. God gave him a beautiful woman to love, a place to live, some land to farm, two good legs and two good arms. The devil came sneaking around one night, decided he would do a little evil to Ike, figured out he'd hit the old man where it hurt, so he filled up all of Ike's wells with dirt. Ike went out to get his morning drink, got a dip full of dirt, and his heart did sink. This sounds country and western, doesn't it? He knew it was the devil, so he said with a grin, God blessed me once, he can do it again. So when the rains don't fall, the crops all fail, and the cow ain't putting any milk in the pail, don't just sit around waiting for a check in the mail. Pick up your shovel and dig another well. Just pick up your shovel and dig another well. <laughs> you know, sometimes you just got to get up and dig another well because the last one was just filled with dirt. But that's what the enemy does. He comes against us and he works against us and he pushes against us. But let me tell you, the gates of hell shall not prevail. And walls were made for leaping over according to David. So when the gate comes up and the wall's raised up, just push against it, leap over it, because you're headed where? To completion. And God's going to help us complete our journey so that we receive the crown he's laid up for us. Amen.